years 1861 to 1865 were the most traumatic and tragic of our nation's history. It was a time of unparalleled human drama in which virtually every American, from the president to the humblest private, played a role in shaping the future of their country. So deep were the divisions of that house divided that friend fought friend and brother fought brother to settle once and forever questions left unanswered by the founding fathers. Those four bloody years of civil war claimed 620,000 lives and seared the American mind and soul for a century thereafter. For the survivors of that terrible war, the scars, both physical and spiritual, would last a lifetime. And yet, with passing decades, time eased the painful memories of the trying march, of inadequate rations, wasting illness, and the horrors of the battlefield. As the war faded into myth and memory, the aging veterans in blue and gray looked past the suffering and hardship, distilling their shared experience into a heritage of heroic deeds of devotion, duty, and honor that they hoped would ennoble future generations of an America reunited. Above all, the veterans wished their service and sacrifice to be remembered. And as they marched with thinning ranks into a new century, the invention of the newsreel camera enabled technology to record their moving image, their faces and voices, allowing us to remember them as something more than a stilted pose, a bronze statue or a name on a marble headstone. In 1887, it occurred to prolific inventor Thomas Alva Edison that he could make an instrument that would do for the eye what his phonograph had done for the ear. He created Edison's projecting kinetoscope, a machine that projected a moving image on a screen. Edison recorded scenes of daily life in the America of the 1890s including what may be the earliest motion picture recordings of veterans of the war between the states. Although the great conflict had been over for three decades, its experiences remained in the minds and souls of those who had served. For the remainder of their lives, these survivors would perpetuate the memories of fallen comrades and the legacy of their own heroic deeds. The proud old men who once had worn the blue and gray looked beyond the commemoration of past glories to a time when no veterans would remain to tell of Bull Run, of Shiloh, of Antietam, of Gettysburg. The experience of war forged a brotherhood that transcended politics, loyalties, divisions. When the veterans returned to the peaceful fields, once strewn with the wreck and carnage of battle, Yank and Reb stood side by side, Americans. The ceremonies attending the dedication of the Pennsylvania Monument at Petersburg, May 19, 1909, was one such occasion. Old animosities were forgotten. Perhaps General Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, himself a battle-scarred survivor of Petersburg, put it best when he wrote, What wonder that men who passed through such things together should be wrought upon by that strange power of a common suffering, which so divinely passes into the power of a common love. Ultimately vanquished in battle, the proud veterans of the Southern Confederacy marched down through the decades with spirits unbroken. It is all the better that the war was fought, even though our cause went down in defeat, one Southern veteran said. The struggle has left a heritage of brave deeds, a history of heroic endurance, of fidelity to country and home and fireside for the whole American nation, North and South, to cherish. America's splendid little war with Spain in 1898 
further unified the people of North and South. Not content to sit idly by as America entered an exciting age of national expansion, this time the blue and gray would fight side by side under one flag. Former Confederate Cavalry General Joseph Wheeler, a West Point graduate of 1859, had fought at Shiloh, Murfreesboro, and Atlanta. Wounded three times, 16 horses had been shot from under him. Now he donned a blue uniform to lead American troops in Cuba. In this rare film clip, we see a diminutive Joe Wheeler conferring with Secretary of War Russell A. Alger, himself a former colonel in George Custer's Michigan Cavalry Brigade. Another old Confederate who now wore Yankee blue was Fitzhugh Lee, the rollicking cavalier who rode with Jeb Stewart and a nephew of Robert E. Lee. On New Year's Day, 1899, Fitz Lee led an American parade through the streets of Havana. The field commander of U.S. forces in Cuba was portly General William R. Shafter. Shafter had received the Congressional Medal of Honor for gallantry at the Battle of Fair Oaks. After the Civil War, Pecos Bill Shafter battled Indians on the southwestern frontier. A former store clerk turned lieutenant in the 22nd Massachusetts Nelson A. Miles emerged from the war a 25-year-old major general. He bore the scars of four wounds, Fair Oaks, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Petersburg. In the 1870s and 80s, Miles became the most successful Indian fighter in the army, so successful that he rose to the very top, general-in-chief. Miles delighted in military pomp and pageantry, and even after his retirement could be seen riding at the head of 20th century soldiers. In October 1917, the blue and gray revisited the once shell-torn, now peaceful battlefield at Vicksburg. The memorials they erected embodied something more than regimental pride and the memory of fallen comrades. The obelisks of granite and statues of bronze were not just a tribute to the past, they were an appeal to future generations. These monuments shall last, said former Confederate General William Bate, and through all the coming years shall inspire our remotest descendants with the loyalty to conviction which these fields illustrate. A spectator at the 1903 reunion of Civil War veterans declared, the world will never see their like again. And as their ranks diminish, the reverence felt for the survivors will increase. As America began a new century and entered the modern age, the graying survivors of the bloodiest war gathered in fraternal reunion on the fields where so many comrades had fallen. Once again, they shared the humble confines of a canvas tent and stood in line to dine on simple soldiers' fare. One old rebel eating with a friendly Yankee was heard to remark, we have broken bread together. I do not call this a meal. I call it a sacrament.
reunion at Gettysburg in the summer of 1913 marked the 50th anniversary of the greatest battle ever fought on American soil. At the famous stone wall where they had once locked in combat, the old men now shook hands. It was the largest gathering of Union and Confederate veterans since the war. Some 55,000 were in attendance. Their average age, 72. Their mutual spirit of reconciliation was noted by Joseph Leathers, a wounded veteran of the Stonewall Brigade. We cannot forget the memories of the past or the cause for which we fought and bled and so many of our comrades died. These memories are a part of our lives, but it does not take away from the love of our common country or the glory and the valor of American manhood, no matter on which side it was displayed. Former Yanks and Rebs, now content to be plain Americans, tented under canvas one more time, swapped yarns with their pards and toured the hallowed ground of Gettysburg. Some, like this Confederate first sergeant, displayed battle-torn relics of their wartime service. Only one of the battle's senior commanders was still alive in 1913. 93-year-old Major General Daniel Sickles, commander of the Union Third Corps. A colorful character, fond of whiskey, women, and cigars, Dan Sickles' unauthorized movement of his corps on the second day of the battle remains one of Gettysburg's great controversies. The general's right leg, if not his reputation, was a casualty of the battle. Some of the most significant wartime innovations took place in the field of naval technology. One of these, the emergence of the ironclad warship. The USS Canonicus, one of the Union's fleet of monitors, had seen action on the James River and at Fort Fisher. In 1907, a review of Teddy Roosevelt's great white fleet included the Canonicus, still in service, one of the last of the ironclad monitors. Not long after the war, the veterans established fraternal organizations dedicated to the care of crippled and destitute comrades, aiding the widows and orphans of those who had died in service and perpetuating the legacy of their own deeds of valor. The largest such veterans organization was the Grand Army of the Republic. With a peak membership of 425,000, the GAR became a powerful political lobby wielding its considerable clout on behalf of Union veterans' benefits. Three of its members would become presidents of the United States. Gathered at their annual national encampments, the faces and military bearing of these old men reflected their pride in having served their country well. Still hale and hearty, they wore their medals and corps insignia, some their wartime uniforms, and four years of drill at the manual of arms was not forgotten.
Maine, 64 years after Appomattox, included veterans of the U.S. regulars, the Vermont Brigade, and the Fighting Irish Brigade, sporting sprigs of green in their hats. Technology added a new element to film, sound. All right, sir. General Stevens, it's a pleasure to greet you, sir, as the incoming commander of the United Confederate Veterans of America. General Sneed, I thank you for your kindness and your appreciation. Thank you, sir. In this rare film clip, we see the daring southern horseman who had followed the hard-riding, hard-fighting Nathan Bedford Forrest, the untutored military genius dubbed a wizard of the saddle. In New York City, the annual Memorial Day Parade on Riverside Drive included veterans of some of New York's most famous regiments. <laughs> All right, let's go. We are the veterans of the Civil War, 61 to 65. This flag is of the Hawkins who are New York. Now salute. Thanks very much. I'll take it on. Okay. Hey, you. battle-torn, blood-stained regimental colors passed in solemn review. The, the convention decided not to approve the joint reunion. And the reunion will be next year at uh, Montgomery, Alabama. 
It is, but we will hold a reunion so long as there are two veterans left to hold it. I greet you, sir, as a native of my native state, Mississippi, whom we all love and honor and will do so until the last day. Richard Alexander Sneed, commanding general of the UCV, at age 16 had joined the 18th Mississippi of Barksdale's brigade. He fought through the war with that famous command, and in May 1863, as Barksdale's men defended Fredericksburg in a second bloody battle, Sneed was severely wounded. He recovered, rose to the rank of sergeant, and was captured at the Battle of Sailor's Creek three days before the surrender at Appomattox. And to wear the crown of the season. The reunion of the Confederate veterans in my native state, on the sea coast of the land of my birth. I love my native state as I do my country. God bless Mississippi. Fine. It's a reunion in Rebellion, eh? Yes, more people here, and the treatment is just like. And did you ever see as many pretty girls? No, I never did. Did you hear that there pretty woman talking? Yeah. Up there and bagging on the old soldier? She, and I wanted to hug her. Oh, and they couldn't get to her. Just tell her, hold on, that you, you want to have a word with her. Well, I'll, next time I see her, I'll fix it all up. All right. I'm going to hunt her up, too, this evening. She may be up here this evening. Well, she'll be here. Uh, the old girl is gone, you won't get to see her. No. What are you going to do about it? I'll hunt another one. <laughs> I don't think you'll find out another as crazy as that one. I'll tell you, when I was a little boy, he used to wear long dresses. Some of them three, a red background. Well, then they uh, commenced wearing them big, they like, sort of like this little lady here. And then they commenced cutting them off. They were cutting them off. They were cutting them off. And you never saw here a sight in your life. <laughs> 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 We are the last of the old bodyguards of our masters served through the war between the states. And we have been to all the reunions and they have treated us just the same as any other soldier. I'm Mama Duke, Joe Shelburne, bodyguard. Done everything they told me to do. And uh, so one day, Mama Duke, General Mama Duke told me to go and get some chickens. I told him I didn't know what was going on. He said, I've got his gun. It looked like them red chaps on there. I told him, yes, sir, I, I'll go right now. <laughs> well, you ought to know how old I am? Yeah. I'll be 81 years old the first day in August. Dan Winter. Listen to the southern white man. My race would have been in the jumps of Africa today. Ignorance is in the wild beast. He brought me over here and made a human out of me. Friends, we had a man in our country by the name of Bossett. He was a great hand to go out and forage. So we come in one day with a chicken. And the man, where he, the man that he took the chicken from come in and reported it. And now he says, Bossett, 
The, the captain says, Martin, you were under arrest for three days. Sergeant, take him to the guardhouse. So we took him to the guardhouse and put him upstairs. That's all the guardhouse that we had at that time. And uh, the second day he was in there, when he got his feet, he crumbled his heart back down, dropped a loop down, and pretty soon the pigs come around. And you know, they uh, looped, he stepped in the loop, and the pigs went to climbing right up the side of the house. And come in, and the man come down, he says, oh my, Lieutenant, let that man out. He's now stealing my pigs. So they let him out. We had a man in the service, and he was he was picking those things off <laughs> of his pants, you know. And uh, come along and uh, say, uh, those arithmetic bugs that we have. Now, yeah. why do you call them arithmetic bugs? <laughs> the reason why you call them arithmetic bugs is this: the ant to my my. They add to my discomfort, they subtract from my pleasure, and they multiply like age. <laughs> well, so the day came along, and you saw Mike uh, taking the graybacks out of the seams of his pants. So he says, uh, Mike, I see you're picking them out. No, but Jaber says, Mike, I'm, Mike, I'm taking them as I, they come. <laughs> a regiment in marching down in Virginia. One day we came through a portion of the country where the people were in sympathy with the Union cause. And the colonel of our regiment that morning on our march, he said, no, I don't want any, any, anyone to leave their regiment and to go out and pick up things that don't belong to us. And they were marching along finally and uh, the colonel at the head of the regiment on his horse, he looked back, and there was a man, a uh, hog squealing. And he looked back and he saw a man sitting straddle of that, of uh, that hog, holding his hog's ears, holding him down. The colonel rode back there and he said, look here, didn't you hear the order this morning? There should be no foraging? Yes, sir. Well, see, what are you doing here? Well, he says, colonel, I come down here to fight the rebels and I'll be darned if I'm going to let a hog run over me. <laughs> the 75th anniversary of Gettysburg in 1938 was a far different event than the 50th anniversary. 25 years had thinned the ranks of veterans and slowed their step. Now only 2,000 old soldiers were in attendance. Their average age, 92. It was the last great reunion of the blue and gray. Times had changed. America had entered the modern age, and the cavalry that paraded through Gettysburg in 1938 was mechanized. 
President Roosevelt spoke at the crowning ceremony of the 75th anniversary, the dedication of the Eternal Peace Light Memorial. Men who wore the blue and men who wore the gray are here together, FDR said, a fragment spared by time. As each soldier answered the final roll call, those who remained honored their loved comrades with simple but moving tributes, as with the funeral of James Buckley, a farmer who had marched off to war with the 4th Pennsylvania Reserves. The survivors were all too aware of their own mortality, but as always, preserved their pride, their gentle dignity. We offer up this lowly grave alone. May future generations emulate the unselfish devotion of the lowliest of our heroes. Thank you. Thank you. In behalf of the Grand Republic, for whose unity and integrity our comrade James Buckley of the 4th Pennsylvania offered his services during the War of the Rebellion, I most reverently place the flag of the United States upon his castle. The march of another comrade is over. And after it, he lies down in the house appointed for all the living. Thus summon <clears throat> these funeral obsequies remind us of the frailty of human life and the tenure by which we hold our own. In such an hour, as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. It seemed for him as it did in great love when he pitched his tent, or when weary and put sorrow, he lay down with us. So faithful in our remaining marches that we should be ready to fall out and take our places in the great review hereafter, not with doubt, but with faith, the merciful captain of our salvation will call us to that fellowship which upon earth and in heaven remains unbroken. Second hymn. We seek thee with whom there is no death. Open every eye to behold him who hath changed the night of death into morning. In the depths of our hearts we would hear the celestial word I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. As comrade after a comrade departs, and we march on with ranks broken, help us to be faithful to thee and to each other. We beseech thee to look with compassion upon the widows and children of deceased comrades who save our country with the freedom and peace of righteousness and through thine own mercy, the Savior's grace and thy Holy Spirit's favor. May we all meet at last with joy before thy throne in heaven and to thy great name shall be praised forever and ever. Amen. We shall meet, but we shall miss him. There will be one day control. We shall learn when we pray, we
Give us this day our daily and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. parading with jaunty tread, now shambling with halting step. Bent with age, the last veterans marched onward to their final rest, a time when the last campfire would be extinguished, the last tent struck. Finally, one veteran remained, Walter Williams of Texas. Frail of body, his eyes filled with memories and tears, he was the last of the brave soldiers of the Southern Confederacy. Walter Williams, who claimed to be the last survivor of the Civil War, shown here on his 112th birthday, is dead at the age of 117. His passing symbolically closes a great and tragic era of American history. Gone is the last man who could speak from memory of the millions of wearers of the blue and the gray who participated in that mighty and terrible clash that split our country a century ago. ceremonies in Houston and the eloquent messages from national leaders mourn not only Walter Williams, one time forge master with Hood's Texas Cavalry, but all who took part in whatever degree in the war between the states. The veterans are gone now to their final encampment, but their pride their courage, their dignity, and their love of country are an eternal reminder and an eternal challenge to us and to future generations. What we should cherish from the example of these grand old men was perhaps best expressed by Oliver Wendell Holmes, the great Supreme Court Justice, thrice wounded veteran of the 20th Massachusetts. Through our great good fortune, in our youth, our hearts were touched with fire. It was given to us to learn at the outset that life is a profound and passionate thing. While we are permitted to scorn nothing but indifference and do not pretend to undervalue the worldly rewards of ambition, we have seen with our own eyes beyond and above the gold fields, the snowy heights of honor. And it is for us to bear the report to those who come after us. But, above all, we have learned that whether a man accepts from fortune her spade and will look downward and dig, or from aspiration her axe and cord and will scale the ice, the one and only success which it is his to command is to bring to his work a mighty heart.